Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. Recently, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved a form of medical marijuana for the treatment of seizures associated with two rare and severe forms of epilepsy. And it really seems like we hear more and more about people using marijuana to treat all sorts of medical problems and to help overcome the side effects of some traditional medical treatments. 30 states and the District of Columbia currently have laws legalizing medical marijuana in some form. Here to discuss is internal medicine specialist and addiction expert, Dr. John Ebert. So medical marijuana, legitimate for medical use? So... Since we last spoke about this, uh, the National Academies of Science came out with a report, and that report essentially summarizes all the available medical literature looking at the efficacy or the effectiveness of it and the safety of medical cannabis. And what they found was that it is very effective for three specific conditions, Um, and one of them is uh, spasticity. The other one is chronic pain. What was that first one? So spasticity, so muscle spasms. So some people that have spinal cord injuries or some people who have multiple sclerosis can have incredibly painful spasticity. The muscles spontaneously spasm, very painful. It's like a Charlie horse, but constantly. Okay. Right. Um, It's effective for that. Uh, It's effective for nausea. And it's effective for chronic pain and specifically uh, neuropathic pain or pain that comes from a nerve. So what's interesting about their findings is they didn't have a lot of data that actually supported that it was truly effective for the indication that the new drug approved by the FDA is indicated for, which is, which is epilepsy or these severe forms of epilepsy. Um, there is some existing data, but, but they didn't have a lot. Um, I think it's important uh, for patients uh, who are interested to, to, to or interested in, in exploring this as a methodology to talk to their clinicians and, and, and really ask the question, would it seem like the, the condition that I have might be effectively treated by medical cannabis? And those clinicians, I think, need to have that information or there is a, that information is available um, on the internet and can be searched and can be learned so that they can share that with their patients. Is there some science behind it? Do you know why it works? Yeah, so uh, there's been uh, lots of science in the space, uh, which has somewhat been impeded by the fact that under federal law, medical cannabis is illegal. Um, so there's no research. So there is, there has been research. Okay. Um, you can actually, uh, and there has and is ongoing research. Okay. So it, it is possible to have approval uh, to do research with medical cannabis. So there's there's research suggesting that is effective for these conditions. So why why does it work? Um, well, what's interesting about, uh, so I, I, I certify patients uh, for medical cannabis. And when I speak with these patients, um, a lot of them are interested in medical cannabis because they nothing else really seems to have worked. And most of the patients that I've certified have been for chronic pain. They say, I want to try something new. And I say it might be effective for pain. Um, and one of the things that they, they, they really struggle with is some of those preconceived notions about what it is to, to smoke pot, if people traditionally smoke pot, right. and what it is to use medical cannabis. Very different experiences. So if someone smoked a medical uh, or a marijuana cigarette, for non-medicinal purposes, you get 104 different chemicals in there. Uh, States like Minnesota that we are in now have actually limited their program to two of those chemicals. So of the 104 possible chemicals that you get when you smoke a joint, if you will, um, you only get two of them in Minnesota, and those two are tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the, the molecule that gets people high when they smoke, and cannabidiol. Now we think that the cannabidiol has some very interesting and important therapeutic properties. Uh, It doesn't work like tetrahydrocannabinol, but it can actually um, help with pain as an anti-inflammatory. It can actually help with pain to reduce nerve transmission, which is how it might be working for seizures and epilepsy. That new medication approved by the FDA, which I'm not sure if I can mention on the air here or not, but that new medication is basically just pure CBD or cannabidiol. And most of the states have that as one of the molecules that you can get when, you are, when you're subscribed or you're approved for medical marijuana in your state. So in the state of Minnesota, 
uh, the use of, of marijuana is illegal, but it, it is legal for medical purposes. Is that right? So, so it's a great question. So, under federal law, um, it is a Schedule One. Uh, anything derived from cannabis sativa, which is the parent plant for cannabis sativa and cannabis indica, the two main types of of, of, of plants we think about as being the source for uh, cannabis. Cannab any derivative of cannabis, um, so any extracted um, molecule from it or any part of the plant is illegal under federal law. It's a Schedule One DEA medication saying there's no approved use. So basically that's where heroin lives and LSD and ecstasy, they're all Schedule One. So we can't use it clinically. Uh, the states have decided based on states' rights issues that we as states will approve it for not only medical use, but recreational use. And the way they've indemnified clinicians like myself or protected them from losing their license is essentially all we do as providers, and most of the states are set up this way, as we as providers just certify that the patients have a qualifying condition. Now those qualifying conditions vary by state. We have 13 in Minnesota, different states have different ones. Um, and some of them have um, approval for depression and anxiety. We don't have depression and anxiety, for example. So it varies by state. And some states actually give their providers the opportunity to say, it might be helpful for this. I'm going to approve you for this. And basically, the state then subcontracts with companies who sell the, the product through dispensaries. So if I came to you and you were convinced that I had chronic pain or particularly if it was neuropathic, yes. nerve type pain, and, I, and you said, okay, well, I'll give you a prescription, uh, where would I get it filled and what would it be? So uh, good point. So we would never prescribe it. Uh, we can't prescribe it because no pharmacy dispenses it. So I would certify you and say you have chronic pain, and I would go into the the uh, the database basically from the Minnesota. Uh, it's actually run through the Department of Health. I've actually looked at all the states that have medical cannabis laws, and uh, most of them run them through the Department of Health. One one state had through the Department of Commerce, and uh, so uh, but most are run by the Department of Health. So it's not some fly by night. It's actually the the State Department of Health running these 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 uh, these programs. So I would certify you for chronic pain, and then what would happen is you would get an email saying you're certified, and then at least in Minnesota, two weeks later, if you paid your processing fee, you would get a uh, essentially a card to go into the dispensary, and you would work with a pharmacist employed by the companies contracted with the states, and they would actually recommend products for you to use. Mm. When uh, we're just about out of time, but oh, we when, are. There's yeah, so but much you, to talk. I about. know. Well, when you came in, you said the one thing I need to do is unseat the myth. So, what myth do you want to set straight? So, I think there's a lot of preconceived notions among the patients that come in, and they say, "Well, I don't want to smoke pot, and I don't want to do these things," and and the grandkids are laughing at me, and these sorts of things. And and, it, and it's a very <laughs> different experience. And so, I've tried to do two things. I I try to not use the term marijuana. I try to use the term cannabis. Um, I think we need to le legitimize it as a therapy. I need we, we need we need more data, but I would legitimize it. And patients are worried about addiction. There's no in, there's no data suggesting that it, it that the at least the products that we are providing in a medicinal manner are addictive. They're, that patients will not become addicted to these. In fact, some of these molecules that we're giving them have actually been used to treat addiction, such as cannabidiol. Wow. Well, interesting. I, I guess um, we've come a long ways. We have, and we yeah. will continue to. So you are you think, truly, for certain conditions, um, marijuana, well, you don't call it marijuana, but can 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 cannabis. Cannabis. Yes. <laughs> is, is okay and, so, and seems to be effective. So, yes, the data is clear that in some conditions, medical cannabis is effective for those treatment of those conditions. All right. We've been talking about the use of medical marijuana with internal medicine specialist and addiction specialist, Dr. Dr. John Ebert. Thanks so much for being with us, Dr. Ebert. Thanks for having me.